right now that God is going to raise you up from that condition. Frank, I know he's got to go in the morning to they're talking about doing a surgery, going to his foot or his leg and do something. Well, you know what? I call the devil a liar. It's time for the church that Jesus united to believe and stand in faith by what he says, by what he wants to accomplish through us, the believers. Well, you know, if we can't receive from God, how are we going to go out there and give something away to others? There's something that we must possess. I don't go out there and tell someone God loves me just because the Bible said so. I know he loves me because he's proved it over and over and over and over. I've tried to get, get rid of him, and he just will not shake loose. I Go away, God. Leave me alone today. No, can't do it. I love you. I'm tied to you for life. Heavenly Father, we just come to you. We thank you right now for Frank as he goes in tomorrow and they want to do surgery. I thank you for a corrective miracle. I thank you, God. He's going to walk in there and the doctor's going to look in there and see things that they didn't see. Because, God, your name is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals our body. Lord, that's your name. And I thank you that your name is your character. And, God, we thank you right now as we lay our hands according to the word of God. Hands we are laying, well he shall be. In Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Praise God. Tell someone you love them. You can be seated. Praise God. So good to see everybody out there today. Hallelujah. Brother Tom, so good to see you. You're a blessed man of God. And Angie Lou, he's so blessed. They come down here from Austin. Praise God. And see my brother here, Brother Don. St. John the Don. Say hello, Brother Don. <laughs> Praise God. That's a, a friend of mine from three or four months ago now. Good brother. Loves the Lord. Fun to talk to. If you ever go get your eyes checked, you can go over to uh, Sam's. Oh, sorry. His ears. If you need your ears checked. I guess my glasses, I need to clean them. That's why I was thinking of my glasses. But uh, Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, you know, God is good all the time. And as we take up our offering today, I always stand on the word of God. Listen, if the word doesn't enter into our heart, then the benevolence of God will never enter in either. Everything that we acquire is through faith. We must know what God says so we can believe what God says, and then we can become actors. Everybody say, I'm an actor. actor. See, we act out the gospel in the world around us. You're an actor. That's why it feels so uncomfortable to go out and share the gospel with somebody. You go, well, I don't, I'm not Clint Eastwood, or I'm not making my day. And, and you keep looking at yourself as the wrong image. The Bible said, I am to portray what is revealed to me. If it's real to me, I don't doubt it. I go give it away. If someone don't want it, that's not my problem. I'm acting out what my father said I really am. There's the old person that you know, and then there's the one that God knows. And the only way you're going to express the one that God knows is by action. Faith is a noun, but it always has a verb following it. There has to be an activity, something that you do. And when you grow in that, then all of a sudden something on the inside of you pushes the guy on the outside out of the way, and you become real. I'm born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking tongues, baptized in the Spirit, living a life abundant and free, not based on what my bank account says, but based on what God said. Grace has supplied every sufficiency of what we need in our life. So when Jesus saw this, he is the one who was acting out his father's play in this world. And he said, look, the church has always stood on giving or you're punished. He said, you can go to Malachi 3, 8 and you can see all that. You know, you're punished if you don't give and curses and all this junk. Jesus said, I'm coming in a new living way. I'm going to say, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men bring unto your bosom. With what measure you meet, so shall you be met, so says Jesus Christ our Lord. Woo! That's what Jesus said. And you know what? Here's 12 guys. One of them six to burn him, sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. But here he said, I'm consistent to my message. I give it to whosoever will listen. But I'm mandating you to go out and build what I've taught you and others you ain't got it yet. In fact, every one of them rejected him. They all disappeared, except for John. John went to the cross. But they were, all of them scattered. And he had to go get them, gather them back up, and come tell them. They didn't miss it. They'd be chicken. They'd be scared. Because they didn't have the Holy Ghost yet that he was going to put in them. 
And on that day of Pentecost, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. They got it. They were going. They were flowing. They hot. They went out there, and God was healing and delivering and setting free. In fact, they sold everything they had, brought all the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And they went, what is this? We didn't teach this. We, we, what are you doing? They were so full of the Holy Ghost. They were so saturated. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I give you I, Nothing matters, God, but me serving you. That's the church that got us the church we're in today. But it doesn't look like it. Because we've lost the way of what the truth said to have the life that others will see God in us because we're so excited about what God's doing in us. So he taught these men, you're going to go out there in a heathen, perverted world right now. Romans hate you. Greeks hate you. Jews hate you. You're a good company. <laughs> you're going to go out there and do what I said to do now. And they do nothing until they got the Holy Ghost. But once they got it, they understood it. I got it. And God never took and worked. They didn't worry about what they were going to get, how much they made. He said, I'll supply. House doesn't want you. Dust your feet and walk away from it. They learned to trust him wholeheartedly. And as you give, always remember, you should know what you give before you come to church. Not to beat you up for offering. That's between you and God. You get in there with God and say, hey, God, I want mine to be a memorial before you. Here, I'm putting a signpost out in heaven. Whatever you do, that's between you and God. God doesn't look at the person that gave a dollar and someone who gave $5,000. It's not equal amounts. It's equal commitment. It's just a commitment that you're learning to trust God in everything. And boy, always remember, there's 18 inches from the head to the heart. There's also 18 inches from the heart to the back pocket. Think about that. And you got to, which one controls which one? All right, let's receive the offering. <laughs> I get those looks like, mm, uh, uh. <laughs> Brother Phil, so good to see you today. Glory to God. That precious bride of his, man. That healed woman. Your anniversary today. Happy anniversary. Glory to God. Stretch out your hand toward the offering. Heavenly Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for the free will offering of your people. God, I'm so excited that they got up this morning with you on their mind. And they came to church today, Lord God, and that they want to receive from you. God, just bless them with a bounty of knowledge and wisdom of what to do with life's problems. And God, I thank you right now that every penny will result in a soul for the kingdom of God. It's not the size of the building. It's the size of the hearts. And God, we pray for a brand new start in somebody's life through the free will giving of your people. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. Praise God. Amen. Children's church, y'all can go. Hallelujah. They're over there without you. Okay, Bob's going to go. He's got the... Okay, glory to God. All them smiling faces out there. Praise God. Well, you know... I've been teaching a series on knowing the inner man versus the outer man. And, you know, a lot of times we're so busy with our intellect that we follow our outer man who's ruled by his senses. So everything we do is we bring in data or information into our brain and then we consistently divulge it into different departments and things we do with it. But what happens is that we start being led by what we know instead of what we sow. God wants you to sow the kingdom inside your heart, which is where you belong. The inner man is born of God. That inner man is not somebody that can ever fail, fall short, miss it. But he can be confused by what the outside man is being involved with. Everything that you get challenged with in your life is usually an experiment that you're either going to win or you're going to lose at based on what you believe. Sometimes you know in your heart, don't go that way, you shouldn't do that, but you do it anyway. Then here comes the great voice of condemnation. You call yourself a Christian. Look what you're doing. And start beating you up. See, if you would learn that God does not judge you like the world judges you or you judge yourself. God says, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. I can be what it says I can be. And the disappointment is so many believers take their Bible to church, lay it down. Bye, see you next Sunday. 
and wonder why life's so distorted and so confused. Because your vision is lost. We are what God said we are. John Osteen put that in my heart back in January 22, 1980, and it sent me on a course to get ahead of fear because fear was always going to depress you because it's showing you what you're not. But God will always show you who you are. And that's why it's a faithful commitment to get His information into your heart and fight through your own carnal man so the inner man has weapons to fight with. See, when Jesus left his throne, he came down to earth, he became a man. He did not have what he had in heaven. It said he left it all there, and he became a human being. The only difference was he didn't have any sin in him. He was born of the Father. So Jesus had the inner man. He had to now give it up and learn who he was again. So it said he studied as a little boy, he studied the temples, and he amazed the, the people that were teaching him how wisdom he had, how strong he was in the Word. He was asking them questions. And they were going, why is this little 12-year-old, my gosh, this kid is something else. Even his parents came and found him afraid. Why, where have you been? He said, did you not know I was about my father's business? He had a depth in him that was deeper than you or I ever could imagine. But one day he decided... He was going to give it all up. Then all of a sudden he left that wisdom again. And he became you and me. And he got on that cross. When he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who did that sound like? You and me. God, where are you? God, how come you don't help me? What's going on in my life? He said, that's because you have been separated by your own carnal thinking and your own reasoning systems and you don't believe what my prophets and my apostles have said. Bam. Jesus died, took that, that guilty conscience and all that junk out of us, whipped it out, went back to heaven. Then he said, now I send my spirit back to those who will follow me and believe me. They adhere to and rely upon and depend upon what I say, not what they think. This has nothing to do with what we think. It has everything to do with what we believe. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you consult your outer man, what do you think about that? Well, I think you're stupid. I think you're getting religious. You're being brainwashed. You know, that's a good idea, brain. I think I'm going to wash you. You need a washing. You need a cleansing. You need a purification. You need a sanctification. You need a redemption. So therefore, I'm going to clean out all the stuff that was loaded into my brain by the devil, the flesh, and the world, and I'm going to reprogram it with the Word of God. Can I get an amen? amen? You see, there's a reason. What is your reputation before God? You know, Bob taught on our, our men's breakfast yesterday morning, and it was a very good question. He said, you know, who is God? I can give you my interpretation of it, but what is yours? Who is God? See, it's not an intellectual, philosophical understanding of stuff. It's a revelation. It's something that God made real in your heart. No man put it there. God did. So that's why you've got to keep following God and what he said to determine the, the outcome of your life. It's not based on what you do, but it's based on what you know. If you grow in God, you'll understand the glory of God. See, grace has given us access to the glory. If you really look at your life and mine, we can see all the inconsistencies and the, the malfunctioning things we do in life in the natural. But God said, my grace is sufficient. Grace is a very powerful tool. Paul was so intellectual, his brain was so large, he knew everything about the Old Testament. But he didn't know anything about the grace of God. And he had to say, look, you've got to listen to me, Paul. Those demons that are whooping up on you and beating you down, you're asking me to remove them? Well, I can't. You can't? What do you, you mean you won't? No, I can't. I gave you power to trade over scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. I gave you authority over the devils to cast them out. My grace is sufficient. Everybody say that. My grace is sufficient. It is necessary and vital that you understand the ability of God, the fullness of God, the power of God, the anointing of God is all found in grace. 
That's why people fight it. Oh, you that sloppy agape, that greasy grace. You people over there think you got all wired. You can act like anything you want to do. Now, little, 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 little. I said, no, listen to me. The man that I know on the inside of me, I know better. I'm also knowing the man on the outside of me. I'm learning him too. And he, I don't like. But the one on the inside, I like him. Why? Psalms 45, 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. That's what you see grace is. It's like gold that's been put inside you and me, but the outside adornment that we wear, it doesn't match up with the gold that's on the inside of us. Can I get amen? amen. See, if you look at the word glory, if you define it, it means honor resulting from a good opinion brightness. Seen in spiritual realm, it's a good report, it's a fame, it's a renown, it's a reputation. There's people that know James Benson, they don't know him as the GED and TDC, ex-convict, drug addict, dealer, all that junk back in 1980. They will tell you today, that man, get around him, he's going to never shut up about Jesus. Tell you, a man, Don. You're going to know that all of a sudden that person is not who he used to be. Because why? The defining factor of my life now is what grace has provided for me. That there is an inner man. And you know what Satan tries to do with a lack of knowledge which causes people to perish is they never get a hold of what God said and base it on because God said it, not because they can understand it. Your intellect has nothing to do with who you are. The spirit has everything to do with who you are. You are a spirit that lives in a body that has a mind, will, and emotions, and therefore you need to discover what God says belongs to you because he said it, not because you think you're worth it or you deserve it. Can I get an amen? amen. See, the manifestation of all the excellencies of God are found in grace. To glorify God and have a good reputation in heaven, we must not only do excellent things, but do them for the excellent reasons, with excellent motives. Manipulating con art and people have robbed the body of Christ in the nation because they've learned how much they can get for what they do, and then they sell themselves to the people and then condemn the people if they don't buy their record tapes and all their other junk. What has to do with God and you is God and you. Everybody say, God in me. God in me. See, I can't put God in you. You can only put God in you. I can teach you what God says, but I can't make you believe what God says. Because you know why? You're going to leave and say, now what do you think about that carnal mind? I think that's a bunch of junk, man. You'll have to stop doing this and stop acting like that. No, no, we should just throw that away. And many a believer stay carnal all their life. And just like Paul said, I can't speak to you as men but as babies because you're still carnal. You still want your way. I don't want my way. I want his way. And I understand his ways are excellent. They're going to be awesome. Can I get an amen? amen. See, if, if we look at uh, 1 Kings 7, verse 51. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated. Even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. You see, everything was done in excellence. When he put all that stuff in there, he knew what people would admire. He knew externally that if we put all this gold and all this fabulous stuff and all that, people would come in and hopefully they would see that there is a God that is glorious. They said it cost the temple to build it was like $6 billion in our money today. They brought in so many tons of gold, so much of silver, so much of everything, and they built this Oedipus. Why? Because people were sense-oriented. Just like a lot of religious churches I've gone into that are cathedrals that are huge and they're three-dimensional. And boy, man, you can almost get, like you think the Holy Spirit's moving statues. They're winking at you. Why? Because it's so dimensional that your brain is trying to take in all the ovulence and all the junk. And you're going, I've seen people scared going, they walk in like they're afraid. God's going to get them. I'm going, that's not the temple. Raise your hand. That's the temple. 
I'm looking at the temple of God right there in front of me. The temple of God's in me. We are sanctuaries of God. We transact business for the kingdom of God. And someone look at you and say, you don't look like you've got nothing. Well, I'm going to take their opinion. I know what i got in my heart. Then I'm going to bring it out and watch God manifest it. So when we see that the temples that are built by man, they always bring a, a something that looks good, but doesn't mean it's always real. Look at uh, 1 Kings 8.11. It says, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. See, the glory was called the Shekinah glory of God. Let me tell you something. I can sit here preaching right now, and if that glory fell in this room right now, I'd just go. Who can talk over God when his presence fills this room so full like a cloud? All the intellectual things would just disappear because God's presence was so strong, people wouldn't even say nothing. They just wanted to bask in it. They wanted to learn. See, glory filled the house because they had built the house for his glory. You see, the difference will always be God builds his house for his glory, not for ours. You've got to understand, if you understand glory, then you understand that the glory of God is within you. That glory is the essence of of his being. See, if you look at Jesus, he said he was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and mercy. He was the glory of God the Father. So take that word glory. Jesus was the essence or the very heart, the very being, the very nature of God himself. So God says when we were born again, he placed that same heart inside you and me. But we don't experience the fullness of it because we're tempered by our exterior things we fall through. That's why the just shall live by faith. And what is faith? It's believing. Faith comes by and the Word of God. So one day the little believer is going to wake up and he's going to say, I've been following the deceiver instead of the true believer. I've listened to circumstances more than I've listened to God. All of a sudden, my mouth ought to be a pen of a ready writer speaking the Word of God, confessing the Word of God, standing on the Word of God, and all of a sudden, I become God-like to a world that doesn't know it. And God's not ashamed for you to represent Him. He's not looking at you and saying, well, one day when you got it. No, you already got it. Everything is in you already, but something's lied to you and deceived you to think you have to earn or deserve it. Can I get an amen? amen. Romans six eighteen. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Everybody say, I'm free from sin. Now, how many of y'all messed up last week? Don't raise your hand. Wait a minute, he just said you're free from sin. Did he lie? Then sin has already been eradicated and done away with. Sin is a product of carnal attributes, carnal knowledge. And when you keep following carnal knowledge, then sin lies at your door. But if you'll walk in the righteousness and the peace and the joy of God that he says are yours because he declared it, because he decreed it, because he will establish it, then all of a sudden those things you're so sin prone to start falling off. Look, I was, a, I was an alcoholic. Man, back in the, in the day, I mean, to me, I, one beer was too many and a thousand wasn't enough. And I used to tell people, look, I might as well get me a gallon jug of beer and put it on the back of my truck, stick it in my arm and ride around. Because I'm going to be an alcoholic. I surrender to it. I give my life over to it. It's been 40 years since I've had a drink. God said, you little idiot. Silly willy. You think I can't fix you and change you? you there's nothing in this earth that I can't change. You let me. I'll never be a Pentecostal. I'll never be a, a Baptist. First place he went, joined the Baptist church, stayed there five years. Then he took me over to Pentecostalism. I said, why do you do that, God? He says, get your head fixed. It's not one way or the other. It's my way. When you learn to walk and trust and rely on me and depend on me, I will give you the ability, I'll give you the strength, I'll give you the courage, 
You know, it sounds easy to get up here and preach to people. I had a brother tell me the other day, he said, man, it's tough when you look in their eyes out there. Uh, Y'all all over the place, man. You know, that's just a part of the territory that you get the gift to do that in. God says, I want you to grow people up from me. That don't mean that when they walk out of here, they're going to even care about what you taught. They're going to go to their barbecue. They're going to do whatever they want to do. But God said, James, it's written in the book what you taught today. Whether they got it or not, I wrote it down. I know what you preached. I know whatever preachers preached from the time Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So you've got to understand why you do what you do is because you're called to do it. Not because you're pleasured by doing it. Not because everybody blesses you for doing it. It's just that it needs to be done. God said when he comes back, he wants to find faith working in the earth. Faith is a belief in something that's bigger than you, bigger than me. And you want to hopefully get people that are interested enough to want to come and learn. So that they don't need me, they got him. I guarantee I might not always show up at something, but his word always shows up. He said he's your ever-present help in the time of your troubles. As you reach into God, he reaches into you. 1 Corinthians 3.12 Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If a man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Listen, God always thinks it's vital to understand the motive of why you do what you do. You know, a lot of people can fake you out. I told Debbie the other day, if all the people that told me they're going to be here this Sunday would come to church, We'd have a thousand people here. They lie. <laughs> no, it's true. It's politically correct. I don't hurt your feelings, so let me give you a little. I'll be there. And they don't. Now, that sounds cute, that little thing, but God says, they tell me that all the time, James. They tell me they love me. Then they're out there sinning. They tell me they do this. They're out there doing this. He said, James, understand one thing about the human family. They're all messed up, including you. Don't think more highly of yourself. Understand that as you cause people to come to truth, so that's what they wear as their banner. That's where their heart is tied to, truth. Why do people get hurt all the time when preachers fail them? Why? Because they're looking at it through the carnal man or the exterior man and don't remember that's still a man. He still can mess up. I heard one time, man, my pastor in this town, he was powerful at five, six hundred in a short time. And boy, it was everything hot and boy, he was cranking. Then he's in adultery. What? That's called human. The only divine one was Jesus. And the level you spend in the word for the right reason, for the right motive to help you. My place is not to get famous. My place is to get you right in the position where you hear God for yourself. The light goes on. You go, I got it. Everybody say that. I got it. Say it again. I got it. You see, when you can say, I got it, you don't need me because you got it. You come to church to get tweaked on who you are so that you go out and be who you are. And then somebody will see you raising your hands in public and praising God. They'll hear you go to a restaurant and get blessed and somebody reached over and bought your meal and say, Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And he the next year is going, Jesus stuff. That's okay. They just ain't insulted with any affection or love from God yet. The person that's hurt you the most is helping you. The one that knocks you down is actually the best friend you'll ever have. Because God has to use these circumstances in our life to turn to him and say, Lord, what meaneth this? I'm the greatest guy since sliced bread. How come they're talking bad about me? How come they're doing all this? God said, well, who said I'm in the bread? I'm the bread of life. You need to be eating from me. You need to understand that maturity is going to come through you having to give up some things. You changing things. Because he motivates you to do it. 
Not because of Im image that somebody's going to say, oh, he goes to that church, look how, how wonderful he is now and all that. No, it wasn't because they went to that church. It's because they went to that God. When you go to God and you start saying, Lord, I'm yours. You created me in your likeness. Then, God, I don't look like you. He said, well, good. You're finally asking me questions. Let's talk. Now I'm going to start feeding your inner man. Now, now let me make you beware. Once your inner man starts getting fed, then guess what? You start being led. Because when you start getting fed, you start getting led. The ways of God are not beyond understanding to the believer. You and I can listen to what he said, acknowledge what he said, recognize what he said, and then you know he's talking to you, then just receive it. Now, it's going to build you into the person God wants you to do and be for him. There might be an assignment that he has for you that's different than he has for me. And then I don't know your plan and purpose, but he does. So the more we get acclimated to the truth, the more we start growing, the more free we get from our external positioning to our internal positioning. The one I am in the Spirit. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, our heart, our human spirit, has got to be reborn. And then it has to be educated. There are a place where 1 Peter 2, 2 said, As a newborn babe, desire earnestly the sincere milk of the word of God, wherefore you may grow thereby, if so be that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. So the beginning of your life was grace. When you found your place, now you need to find your space. That's where you're going to start following God and fear will come and grab you because the unknown, you're not sure, you're unstable, you're insecure. That's why he said a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let him don't think he can receive anything from the Lord. Because the Lord's not going to give you something out of fear. He's going to give you something out of faith. You must believe that he is and a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Can I get an amen? amen. See, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. If I don't get my heart right with God and understand God's love for me, then how can I set someone else free? You know, you can go to church, look pretty, dress up nice, smell good, tip the pastor, take him out to eat, do all these things. You can be blessed, 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 and still be a million miles away from God. Because you think in your mind all these good things that you do, you build your own press report, and then you get prideful. Then you can't hear anymore. You become dull of hearing. Because you only pick and choose what you want to hear. Oh, I like that. That's good. Oh, I don't like what he said today. Hmm. You ever seen people do this? That means they don't really give a rip about what you're saying. That's a spiritual connotation of a carnal realization. I see them all. Then I hear you start meddling or something. They go, ooh. Say, he's not talking about me. Tell someone he's not talking about me. You see, there's a place inside us that we've got to get our motives right. 1 Corinthians 3.12. It says, Now if any man builds upon a foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, and I know I heard y'all heard that a while ago, I said that a while ago, but I want you to understand it's still good. See? The Spirit of God dwells where? In you. If, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which the temple you are. Ever say, I am. I am. Now see, you've got to understand God is serious about your growth and development. There's a lot of Christians that go home early. It happens all the time. God knows more than we know. I believe God showed me years and years ago. There's some people who said, I love them too much. I've got to remove them because they're hurting what I'm about in the earth. I love them. They're going to heaven. They just got there quicker. You know, look, being resistant and obstinate and, and, and causing problems for other people who are trying to learn, it can cost you. There, you know, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall also reap. If he sows to his flesh, he will reap corruption. Wow, that's New Testament. 
See, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom that you understand God wants you to shine forth like the bright morning star. He wants you to illuminate other people's lives. He wants you to guide people into truth. But yet we can systematically theologies of people put ourselves in a box and become nothing to God, even though we're his children. And God says, whoa, stop doing that to me. In Galatians 3, 4, Galatians 6, verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So can you really think you're something when you're really nothing yet? No. Yeah. Has anybody in here ever thought you were something and then you got put into a situation and you went, uh-oh. I don't know what I thought I know. I thought I could take this job. I, I mean, I graduated from high school. I know how to type. I can get on email. They wanted an office person to run the whole office. Pay you $38,000 a year. I can do that. I got it. Then you go in there and they say, okay, shovel on this and that and pull this and that. And this is the dot system and this is the... And you go, oh. I knew one time they hired a girl at the Christian school I was in. And she had a PhD. I was in counsel with her. I said, brother, you don't want to hire that girl. She got some major issues. Wow, but she got a degree. We want that degree. Show it in the school. Hey, PhD. PhD. Please help. D. Dummy. Post hole digger. That girl got in there and was in the class six weeks. Did nothing but sit. Just sat. Didn't teach them. Didn't give them assignments. Just looked at them. Uh, we got problems here in Houston, Texas. They had to fire her. She didn't know nothing. She had the paperwork, but she had no skill. She had no ability. You, you, you got to understand, there's a lot of people in here that are not really highly educated, but you've been revelated. And you have a lot of revelation that God could apply and get farther. In fact, today, they're not looking for degreed people. They're looking for knowledgeable people, people that are educated. Someone that knows what they're talking about and can do it. My daddy had a guy come to him one time and said, he, he, the college kids would come out to plant and work, and daddy would throw them out trying to teach them something. And they went, ah, I know all about this. It's this flow chart, this, this, this and that, and that, 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 and just cut my daddy off. Daddy having a high eighth grade education, but been in that plant for 27 years, and he kind of had some common sense. He kind of knew flow sheets. He knew all that stuff. He got out there and threw that stuff down. The guy looked at it. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And my dad went, okay, go out in the field, find MS-7929, turn it into the manual position for me, please. Oh, got it, okay. Wrote on a piece of paper, walked out. Five minutes later, he's coming back. Oh, uh, do you know where that's at? Sure. It's right there. You're, you, you showed it to me. It was there. But you don't know where that is. You know what it says on the paper, but you don't know where to find it. That, my young man, is what we're looking for to hire in this company. Someone that's not going to tell me what I'm doing. I'm going to tell you what you're doing. Because you could blow the plan up if you turn something the wrong way that it shouldn't go. See, you little man with great education need to be taught. We all need to be taught. There's nobody who can sit there and say, I've got it all. I've arrived. We learn. Amen. We grow in the truth. We've got to examine our work, and we've got to avoid comparison. One of the things that Jesus always said is, look, we dare not make ourselves of the number that comparing ourselves amongst ourselves and commending ourselves to ourselves, we become unwise. But let every man think soberly as the day approaches. Look, guys, we can all fool each other. We can all play games and all that, but the day approaches when we will stand in his presence, and there'll be no hidden things. It'll all be brought to the light. Why not say, why don't I walk in the light now as he's in the light so he can correct me and show me the areas of instruction that I need for my life. Then when I see him face to face, it's not going to be like, oh gosh, can I go to the back of the room? Wait, Y'all all go up and talk to him first. I want to wait. No, I want to run to the front. Say, here I am, Lord. Because I walked with you and I let you discipline me. I let you change me. I let you mold me and shape me. Why? Because my inner man is starting to grow. He said, though my outward man is perishing, my inward man is growing day by day. 
That means if you will heed the word of God, you'll answer the call of God. Then you'll understand the purpose of God and the will of God. And therefore, you will be one who's enlightened, pulled out of dark, pulled out of religious ways of looking at stuff, and become someone that's beneficial for the kingdom. That you can give what's inside you away to someone and they can receive it. You know, there's a lot of things that are spiritual that are not carnal. I mean, Brother Don and I have gone to a restaurant sit down, and I've, I've led two waitresses to the Lord sitting there at the table. People spiritually, and well, how do you know that was real or not? How do you know? Well, the word always checks the word. If you and I are ambassadors for the kingdom of God, then we represent the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? amen. So then we need to know what his kingdom plans are and what his purposes are and how to bring those into manifestation in the world around us. I can remember because someone told me, you know, when you're in this for 35 years, so you've had enough experience with things working the Word of God that you have things that you've discovered and you've seen and you've understood, and God don't let you forget them. They become a part of your repertoire. You actually have confidence in what you know to do. And I can remember one guy, that friend of mine, I was training him in soul winning. He was a, uh, children's, a youth pastor. We were going out there, and then he was going to Mardi Gras, we were doing stuff. Well, he went to this rock concert with some other group out of Houston, and they said, they were telling him all their stuff. They went out there to this concert, they were passing tracks, and he remembered the way I taught him to do it, the big question track, how to bring someone to saving all of Jesus Christ. Would you like to know Jesus? Would you like to have an assurance in your heart you die, you'd go to heaven? This, this, first of all, is not based on your sin life. It's based on his will. He paid the debt to save the lost. He didn't tell me to judge which lost ones, to pick and choose. He wanted them all. So then you go out there, and he was presenting this guy with that. And as he gave the track to the guy, and, and the guy said, yeah, I'd like that. He took him by the hand and said, pray it was me. And this other guy in that other ministry just jumped in there, slapped his hand out and said, let me ask you something. You ready to give up drugs? You give up all while living and sex with girls and doing all this stuff and drinking and smoking and going and listening to this devil music? You ready to give all that up? Hell no, I ain't ready to give it up. Then go to hell and go enjoy yourself. You ain't ready for God. He was telling me, man, I learned a new revelation last night. I said, let me give you a better revelation. Repent. Repent. Because you let that religious man steal a soul from the kingdom of God. And the, and the Holy Ghost, everybody say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost brought back to his remembrance right there and he started crying. He said, oh my God. The guy that taught us in the meeting he taught us about how, the, the, trying to motivate us to go out there and win souls out there at these concerts. He said, I was one who went out to a concert, and I took a man by the hand, and I prayed and asked Jesus in my heart. I went in and got high and loaded, went through the concert, went home with the girl, slept, did all the evil things. He said, you know, but about six months later, something inside me was getting dirty, ugly, fearful, guilty. And I ran to an AG church and ran up that aisle and gave my heart to Jesus. The sad part is he didn't understand what happened. The Bible said that the Word of God is spiritual seed. Everybody say spirit. spirit. You can't feel God with your senses. It's faith. Until you get the Word of faith inside you, it's not going to cause the spirit life to change and grow. What happened was when he accepted outside that concert hall and asked Jesus to come into his heart, he didn't feel like anything happened. Does a woman know she's pregnant right after consummation? No. It takes five, six weeks down the road. She's, bleh, bleh, look what that man did to me. Bleh. She's all sick. Why? Because there was something, a seed was planted and a baby was coming. That Holy Ghost seed, that seed was planted and there's a baby coming. We got to think like God instead of thinking like the world. I don't have to see it. I've, I, all kinds of people say, well, you show it to me and I'll believe it. I said, no, sir, you believe it and I'll show it to you. It's God that's going to work in you, not me. And you plant that seed? You don't know. When I was at Lakewood, I had uh, Brother uh, Johnson. He was teaching us in my last trimester. and he was, I took local church and I was learning about local church. And as we were sitting down talking, Brother Johnson got up there. He just looked so sad that day. It's Friday afternoon, last class. And he was starting to talk about how they're building the big new building and how he loved the children. And he said, most older pastors don't really have much for the kids. 
They're into the adults. That's their flock. That's their children. So they assign others to take care of those responsibilities. But he said, you know, I prayed that God would give me the old building when they built the new one so we could have the children in it. He said, you know, my pastor came up the other day and he said, you know, Brother Johnson, he said, the Holy Ghost told me, when we get this new building up, I'm giving you the old one for the children's church. You know, he said, I had a dream the other night that I died and I went to heaven. So when I opened up the gates of heaven, I was walking through, and hundreds and hundreds of children just ran up to me, hugging me, saying, thank you, Brother Johnson, for giving us Jesus. Thank you. That's why we're here. Oh, I was crying. Everybody else was crying. It was like, oh, God. And I came back the next, that Monday morning to school and said, did you hear what happened? I said, no. Brother Johnson died Sunday night about 1 a.m. in the morning. He had a heart attack. The Holy Ghost grabbed me and pulled me to his chest and he said, never forget what he told you. Never forget the kingdom is real. What you did meant something. Any action you take toward God's will and purpose, it meant something to God. He doesn't think it's light. He knows the faith that you have to have to acquire and give knowledge to someone that don't want it. You have to see the people sitting there. You have to see all the people sitting there don't really care. Hurry up, I've got to go eat. You can see that all day long, and you wonder why there's a shallow Christianity, why there's no depth in God, there's no love and no passion to want to talk about Him to other people. When the more the light comes on, the more joy you have. The more joy you have, the more love you have. The more love you have, the more devotion you have. And everything creates something that others will see. They might not like it. Look out for them bunch over there, man, them weirdos. That's okay. I love them. I just tell them, we're coming to get you. We got a seat for you. And one day, praise God, they're going to show up. Can I get an amen? amen. In Ob Obadiah 1.3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? In the Amplified it says, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you dweller in the refuges of the rock, Petra, Edom's capital, whose habitation is high, who says in his heart, who can bring me down to the ground? But look at Psalms 51, 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. See, God wants you and I to understand the person that we really are is full of control, full of ability, full of talent, full of prosperity, full of provision. It's the man that we have thought we'd known that deceives us and tricks us and makes us stay in the ditch. When you make the switch and start believing the one that's inside you that God put in there, then give him access to the controlling nature and say, I want the divine nature instead of my nature, then bam, something starts happening. People start getting healed. They start getting delivered. They start getting whole. They start getting well. And God's glory is starting to be seen. Look, the devil's not the winner. He's the loser. I don't care what the politics that goes on. I don't care. Listen, the day you get delivered from the way the world views things and get God's view, you're going to be in a fine place. Because I'm not moved by what we see, touch, touch, smell, and feel. I'm moved by what he said. That's what's real. The inner man always strives for that. John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son may be glorifying thee. As thou hast given him power over the flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as those that thou hast given him. And this is the life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Wow. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self and the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Do you realize that Jesus said, Did y'all admire me? Did y'all love me? Did you see everything I did? Did you see my earthly ministry? Aren't you excited? I see a lot of you with tears in your eyes. But let me give you some bigger tears. That person you saw... 
is inside you. And I didn't ask you what you think about it. I talked to the Father about it. I said, Father, I have put what you've given me in those you have chosen. They were mine in this earth. They are yours eternally. Now then, if we would rise up and see the mantle that God has shifted to us because we're believers, then we wouldn't be afraid of dark. We wouldn't be afraid of all the things that are going on around us in the world because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That is not just a scripture. Look, many Christians take scriptures and they just zip right over them and hear you talking and requote it. But do they really know it? That's where we have to get on that road of righteousness and say, God, I am what you said I am. I can have what you said I can have. And I am scared and trembling even to think that way because my carnal mind cannot compute that. But I'm not to live by my mind. I'm to live by faith. Faith isn't for me to go out and tell everybody else, y'all ain't got no faith. Faith was given for me to incur the blessings that are already mine. You can beg God to heal you all day long, and he'll never heal you. Why? Because that's not what he said. I've already healed you. By the stripes my son took on his back, part of my healing problem in the atonement was that I healed your body. So the problem is, God, thank you for healing me. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for giving to me. I am a life that is free. Vincent Oliver, good song. When you really realize the love of God that's inside you, then God's going to manifest it because you trust him. That is the inner working of the spirit that already has. Do you realize one day our earth suit's going to drop off? Our carnal mind is going to be blitzed and made completely the mind of Christ. We're going to get a new glorified body. Listen, that ain't going to be a maybe. That's a done deal. He's already guaranteed you a home, a passionate place in heaven. He's already guaranteed you sonship. Everything is in his word. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. But you can live like, well, one day Jesus will call my name. He did when you were lost and undone. You answered his call. Now get up and go so you can get up and flow. That somebody will grow and somebody will know and somebody else will sow. I love that one statement when I heard that Paul Wimmer when he was singing. He said, can these dead bones rise up? And he said, only God knows. Can these dead bones people that we're all dead in some area of our life, can we rise up and be made whole? He said, Lord, raise up an army of worshipers. Wait, you want to whip the devil? Raise your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, that your kingdom has come. Your will has been done. Everything is finished in you. We don't become something. We are something. We're not going to be. We already are. And if you realize that, then you're going to grab what God said. Well, help me with that, Lord. What does it mean in here? Show it to me. Let me become that. God says, your brain has got to stop seeing yourself what you want to be and start seeing who you are. Then when you see who you are, you'll know what to do, and you'll do it as unto the Lord. And he will receive the glory. Man, when I see Jesus at the end, he takes out there and he looks at that. Thing. He takes all that he's done, and he says, Father, here are all that you have given me. They were mine, but now they're thine. I lay them at your feet, God. I fulfilled your will. But then it says at the end of Revelation, when we get all our trophies and all our rewards and everything that we did, glory to God, he said there's a place we're going to go take it up to Jesus and we're going to lay it at his feet and say, Jesus, I didn't do it for this. I did it for you. Just like you love your father, I love you. I did it from my heart. I didn't do it from my filthy lucre or what I can get for doing it. I did it because I love you. All of a sudden you can see yourself entrusted with love. That you have the love of God. You are the love of God. 
Don't go ask your brother, your sister, or your husband, or your wife, do you not see the love of God in me? Heck no, man, you need deliverance. <laughs> but if you go to God, he says, oh, I see you. I see you. I see you. See, till we let God's opinion of us become our opinion of us, then we will have that love for those who are unlovely, those that are unwanted. Because I know the debt he paid for me, and he's no respecter of persons. This church should be full of people that don't go to other people's churches. I, I tell you right now, I am not from pulling pins. I will call the other pastor of the church and say, do these people, they want to join my church. They left your church. Did they talk to you before they left? If you're not right with him, you're going to not right, be right with me. Learn that you've got to make a cut with things that are hurting you to get truth to help you get free, but not the expense of blabbermouthing about the preacher you left and the church you were part of. Let it go. Get healed. Get delivered. Get up. Get flowing. And all of a sudden, people are going to see the happiness and joy in your life, and they're going to be so excited, they want to come to where you go to church. And believe me, I ask everybody. There's not anybody I think I've met today that's been honest to say they don't go to church. Then I just acquire a step deeper. Where'd you say you go to church? What's the pastor's name? <laughs> well, I haven't been there in a while. Really? How long's a while? Oh, about five years. <laughs> so you lied to me. You told me you were you were going to church somewhere, but you weren't. See, if you can't see that you're hiding, then nobody can make you see that. You got to be willing to surrender and say, God, am I doing what I need to be do? Because if I'm not, I'm a deep doo doo. I don't want to smell. I want to re radiate. You know, somebody walks in, you go, oh. but somebody's radiating, you're drawn to them. Hey, what's going on? Are you look happy? What's it? Oh, yeah, I just got another blessing yesterday. God wants us to be a people that are called by his name, that actu actuate the inner man to overcome our outer man. It's okay to say you're sorry. It's okay to say forgive me. It's okay to look at somebody and say, uh-oh, I messed over them. I don't want to lift up pride. I want to die to that. I want to say, you know, God, let the man with the intent and motive of the heart right come out of me and so shine that if people want to dislike me, they'll have to dislike me for the right reason. That I loved them and cared about them and they didn't want to be loved. Not because I'm condemning them and putting them down because they didn't agree with me. I am not the hierarchy of doctrine. I'm just a revelator of love, and God wants to set people free. And if we'll just keep our hearts in that word and grow, then God, I guarantee, will transform you from one glory to another glory to another glory. And one day, you're going to say, wow, look what the Lord has done in my life and the lives of others. Let's all stand. You know, in life, there's so many broken hearts. There's so many people that are dysfunctional. You know, they've made news commentators now that are the plus and the minuses, the communists and the, and the right-wingers. And they've got everything that's capitalizing off the pains and the hurts and distortions of people. Getting rich off of it. But nobody's giving you the answer. You cannot change this world because of your opinion. God is the only one that can change anything. And his people that are called by his name should understand we are to reach the unreached and tell the untold. We are to help those that are lost and dysfunctional. If you can tell me what's wrong with the city, I had a police officer this place. He said, oh, that town's got 75% crime in it. Man, it's so big and bad. He said, they just need more jails. and more. No, no, no. They need more churches with empty pews. That's what I told her. They need more churches with empty pews that would care and recognize the pain and the hurting and the suffering that's around them and want to put some salve on it. It's called the healing balm of Gilead. How to reach into someone's heart and say, I love you. God loves you. Whether you come to my church or not, you look at me. God loves you. Now, if you want to follow me to that loving place, I'll take you to one where I go. If you don't, I love you anyway. I don't want you to run from me when you see me come down the street because I'm trying to get you to join my church. But I want you to know I will never turn away from you. I've had people leave me and I've done exit interviews. And I always tell them, I want you to know I'm not your master, I'm your pastor. You want to go somewhere else? That's your choice. 
go, God bless you. But just always remember, there's a place that you got a friend. If you ever need to talk to someone about those serious things, you know I'm here. Call me. See you later. Why? Because nobody can lead anybody. They must be led by the Spirit. Find where you belong. Find what you deserve. Find what's real and live it. And somebody else will find the destiny that God has for them. Now, if you're hurting today, if there's an area of your life that you feel like you've been struggling in some areas, you feel almost trapped, that your tongue seems like it's locked up, you can't just share Jesus with somebody. I just want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray that God breaks that yoke of bondage. God, see that hand? You know what? Honesty with God is the best place you'll ever be. Doesn't matter it's not how many numbers get it, it's somebody says, I want it. Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for my young brother. I thank you for his heart, God. He recognizes his shallowness. But God, I say, let him recognize your greatness. That you chose him. He didn't choose you. And God, you will cause his life to get brighter and brighter. That men will come to him to want to know the peace and the love and the joy of God that you placed in his heart. And Father, I just thank you that today starts the first day of the rest of our life. That every one of us, God, will be better off than we were the day before. That we'll understand your love and grace and mercy is already in us. Everything that we need is already there. Allow us to see that. And let the hope of the calling of Christ radiate through this church to affect other people who don't know how much they are loved. We give you all praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. And we all said... And we all say it. Amen. And we all say it. Amen. Praise God. Tell someone you love and you be dismissed. Amen. Oh, blessing you. So good to see you. We just love you. So bless you. So sweet.